probably will spend the rest of my life trying to get my head around. Uh, Winston Churchill said, my countryman, he said once, when you're going through hell, keep going. And that's what my job is tonight and probably for the rest of my life. On the 23rd of May, as I'm sure you might have heard in the news, my son murdered six young women and young men. He wounded 13 others, and then he took it out. He terrorized a community. He shot not only family members, but his psychiatrist, his psychologist, his counselors, his mentor, and he shot the nation. And that is why I'm here. My son, Elliot Roger, was very, very seriously mentally ill. But before I continue, before I, I do what I have to do, and what I've decided to do as my duty as his father, I'd like to actually offer a moment of silence for the victims, the innocent lives that my son took with him, and for Elliot. In order for Elliot to have carried out these heinous, horrible, nasty, incredibly difficult, horrible acts, he must have been in a place that I don't think any of us can ever understand. Maybe people who have suffered from mental illness can understand it, but I certainly can't understand it. Uh, the distortion that plunge into, into darkness, if you like, I think is, is shocking beyond belief. And the scary thing is that none of us knew what was going on in his head. None of us knew his counselors didn't know, his psychiatrists didn't know, his doctors didn't know, I didn't know, and I'm his father. I had no idea that he was harboring thoughts in his head that would make him do premeditated things that shocks the world and ruins and makes a ripple effect around the world of absolute horrendous pain. It's very, very, very scary. Elliot was also hiding these things. He was so intelligent. And this is one of the traits of, uh, traits of mental illness, that you can have it and you can actually manipulate your psychiatrist and your psychologist, and I'm sure the doctors would agree with me, because you're so intelligent, because you have these things in your head, you become adept at being able to hide it and seemingly be normal, yet you're harboring terrible things in your head and then you actually get to a point of such pain and such despair that you act upon them in a terrible manner and that is what unfortunately happened to Elliot. Elliot was such a good liar that none of us ever felt he had the ability to even lie. And what's disturbing is as, as rightly so um, that was mentioned before, I think it was Carrie, who said that this is exponentially increasing, 25%. This is happening more and more and more. I could go on and give you the science. I, I've studied this. I mean, I've had, to, I've had to jump into this extremely quickly because it's my responsibility to try and tell Elliot's story and try and find out what is going on in society that is making this happen. And it's prevalent and it's not going to go away. There have been 74 shootings and uh, in schools and in colleges since Han Sandy Hook. There have been two since Elliot did it. And the only reason there haven't been more is because it's the summer and school's out. And it was very evident after the immediate aftermath of that that I had to do something. Something had to be done. I couldn't bury my head in the sand. And so I need to share Elliot's story, which I will do continually. And also, Use it as a wake-up call. All of us should have had Columbine as a wake-up call. We should have had Virginia Tech as a wake-up call. We should have had Aurora and then Sandy Hook as a wake-up call. But you know what? I didn't. I thought it was up to the politicians, the law enforcement, the mental health 
professionals, you know what, let them deal with it. You know what, it affected my family, and how complacent was I? So I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. I really admire Susan for calling me. I really admire, yes. I think the common thread of all of us sitting here tonight is concern. It's not just the concern of the violent tendencies that can be a result of mental illness, because let's face the facts. Actually, most mentally ill people are in their own turmoil, and they're never violent. God bless Robin Williams. Let me ask you this question. Okay, please. How many of you out there know a friend or have a family member who is affected by depression, mental illness, or has special needs? Put your hand up, please. Or are yourself. Or are yourself, thank you. Ooh, I'm glad we're here. <laughs> Oof, dearie me. That is a big show of hands. And when you find you have somebody who has a problem, or you have a problem yourself, what do you do? There is so much lack of support in this country. There are so many holes in the mental health system that it almost doesn't exist. I've experienced this. I wish I'd heard from, you know, from Shashank and from, you know, from Carrie and, and, and the Staglins and other people before this. I wish I knew that. Although, in my case, it was different because I didn't even know that my son was mentally ill. Although there, there, there were signs, you know, there are common traits. This is something I want to do, by the way. I want to discuss the common traits, not tonight. Another way, because there are a lot of them. But there are ways that you can detect that. But even if you have somebody, a family member or something, that had, or somebody, or you, what do you do? Insurance companies are only going to pay for three nights, 72 hours, even under the Affordable Care Act, that's all they're going to do. How expensive is it to get a diagnosis? How expensive is it to get some kind of therapy? How much is a psychiatrist for an hour? Who's going to pay for it? What about a family in Arkansas that lives in the woods? What are they going to do? I, I don't know. You know? And then there's a stigma. What is the stigma in this country about mental illness? I'm sorry, it really angers me. If you have cancer, you go to a ward. They have smiley nurses with beautiful kind of flowery outfits and they treat you with respect. <laughs> I mean, if you have a mental illness in this country, you're a pariah. You are, because there's no help, there's no resource. Well, there is, but not a lot of people know about it, all right? But the main fact of the matter is that you might, if you're in a severe case, you might end up in a bed that looks like a prison cell, all right? And there are hardly any beds anywhere. I think there are only 12 in the whole of LA County. Mental health is a big elephant in the room, and we, you, have to do something about it. I know that people are doing something about it, and they're here tonight. And I'm really, really happy about that. So let's get to the nitty-gritty. Let's get to the point. A cure would be a really good thing. Prevention is a really good thing. I mean, everybody thought the world was flat one day and then they found out that it was round and we actually got to the moon yes somebody mentioned that billions of dollars in cancer research and there's only a hundred million dollars a year in research for mental health yet it affects all of those people that put their hands up tonight this is a tragedy and they're great they're great schemes out there there's there's naples and there's caps which you know is run by carrot ucla but where does the funding come from for that? Well, actually, it comes from the Staglin Music Festival for Mental Health. It doesn't come from the government. Oh, no. It comes from the private sector. 